brothers and sisters in the faith, we are here to proclaim a power beyond ourselves. We know that we do not have the ability to save ourselves. We acknowledge our need for God to work in our lives and transform us so that we may receive and share God's love and grace. Thanks be to God for his grace to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us worship God. Welcome to all who are here today, especially our visitors. Please take time to share the friendship pad with one another and share it with each other and use it to greet each other in the name of Christ our Lord. I'd like to call your attention to different announcements in the bulletin and hope that you'll mark your calendars and participate as you can. And this morning we have two minutes for mission. One. Uh, from the outreach ministry team about Celebrate Recovery, Harriet Ferrier, and then one from the Congregational Care about an upcoming event. So, Harriet. Good morning. Good morning. Celebrate Recovery is a program designed to help those suffering from addictions it's held every Thursday at Rose Hill United Methodist Church, and the purpose is to fellowship and celebrate God's healing power through 12 steps and eight recovery principles. Wallace Presbyterian Church helps with the program several times a year by providing home-cooked meal for the participants. We prepare the meal here at church, take the food to Rose Hill, where we serve the meal and interact with those involved in the program. The participants often thank us and tell us how meaningful it is to them that we feed both their bodies and their soul, but actually they in turn bless us in so many more ways. Nettie and Rick Batchelor, Susan and Bill Walt Waters, um, Debbie Thomas, Fred Burroughs, Effie Mobley and I are scheduled to be there uh, this Thursday to serve them. And if you think you would enjoy small group interaction that includes preparing and serving a meal and socializing with Celebration Recovery members, please contact me, Harriet Ferrier. My information is in the church directory. Thank you. Okay, just in case you didn't see this big announcement on the back of your bulletin, and Vanessa, show them. Vanessa is my um, helper and one of our ministry team, and we want you to know that we have tickets available. Um, the, it's going to be um, the second annual Shrimp Peru on Friday, October 7th at 6 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. The cost of the ticket is $15 per person and can, can be purchased from any member of our team. Rick Batchelor, Brenda Long, Jerry Hansen, Sandy Cobb, Lois Edgerton, Vanessa Ward, myself, Ann Carter, Cindy Barrow, Mary Carone, and Debbie Thomas. You will enjoy a delicious shrimp roux prepared by Chef Rick Batchelor. <laughs> And this is his second annual one, so he knows what to do this time. But he did the last time. <laughs> also, a special treat following our shrimp dinner will be a dessert table provided by the ministry team. So please join us. We know you will have fun and enjoy the fellowship. Vanessa Ward and I will be in worship hall, in fellowship hall after worship, and we do ask you, so we don't bother Wayne, if you'll make a check out to cash, so, um, or you can pay with cash, which we'd love. So please, please join us so that Chef Rick will do a third <laughs> annual shrimp room. Thank you. He forgot about me. <laughs> I don't know how. Um, the PEP program will have a fundraiser at Johnson Nursery this Saturday, September 24th, and a portion of the sales will go to the PEP program. So we would like everyone, I know y'all are getting your flowers ready and all, so if you can just celebrate, go out to Johnson's Nursery this coming Saturday, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you.
good morning. Clearly, I'm not George Francis. He is at home recovering from a heart attack, but George, if you're watching, hope you're doing well. Please join me in reading the opening sentences. By grace, we have been saved through faith. This is not our own doing. It is the gift of God. For we are God's handiwork, redeemed in Christ Jesus for good works. Works God has prepared for us that we should walk in them. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Celebrate the greatness of the Lord with me. Let us exalt God's mighty name together. Our first hymn this morning is number 12, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested to by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But they are now justified by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as an atonement by his blood effective through faith. Friends, since we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, let us confess our sins before God and one another, first together in a unison prayer, then in silent prayers, and in our responsive assurance of pardon. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we find it difficult at times to place our trust in you. Too often we look at the world and see only violence, pain, destruction, and signs of hopelessness and despair. Too often we rely on our own strength, our own plans, our own devices, rather than trusting in your hand to hold us, your love to sustain us, and your wisdom to see us through. Forgive us, Holy One. Help us turn to you when we are lost, that we might find our way home. Help us navigate the treacherous waters of this world that we might experience your abundant grace, mercy, and love. Help us put our trust in you, that the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus may shine in our lives for all to see. Hear our prayers, O Lord.
The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. Hear God's word of grace to us. In Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Let us sing God's praises for his mercy in our lives. invite the children to join me on the steps for the children's sermon. Good morning. Now that we're sitting down, we're going to stand up and take a walk. But before we do that, if you were here on Sunday night, you might remember dressing up in the costumes and we were the Israelites. Oh yeah, oh, yeah you remember that? That was, that was fun. Yeah. And Miss Carol Steen was Moses. You remember that? You remember how she led us all around? We went past the water and we couldn't drink and we went past places and there was nothing to eat and we came back in here and we talked about how God always watches over us and loves us and cares for us and some of us colored pictures and we're going to take a walk and look at those because look they're in the windows hey Clara <laughs> yes you're excited now walk with me let's go look at the pictures and if you colored it you can tell me this one says this is Robert Coombs the first one Robert look at that says the Lord makes sure I am safe and this is Miss Carol Steens. Says he never stops looking out for me. Let's see who this is. This is Miss Cat Blanchard. She colored this one. The Lord knows when I go out and when I come home. And aren't the flowers pretty? Miss Harriet put those in the window. And here's one. And this was Olivia. Olivia doesn't go to our church, but she comes on Sunday nights. He has made everything in heaven and on earth. Now we're going to go over on this side. Oh, there's some back here. Thank you. This one is, I don't know who that is. It doesn't have a name. Anybody recognize it? Did you color it? It says, he will protect me from getting hurt. And this one says, he never sleeps or takes a break. It doesn't have a name on it. Let's see, we got a few more. This one doesn't have a name on it. It says, he's here with me now and will stay with me always. And well, this one doesn't have a name on it either. The Lord takes care of his people. So all the pictures are about how God takes care of us. This one is by J.J. Rouse. Oh, yeah. The Lord guards me in the heat of the day. They look like they've got suntans, don't they? They're at the beach. They're John Ward. That's good, J.J. This one's by Dr. Phil. Under the light of the moon at night, God takes care of us. And that's it. Let's go have a seat. And those pictures remind us that God takes care of us and that God loves us when we're awake, when we're asleep, when we're at the beach, when we're eating, when we're doing anything. God is there and he's going to look after us. Let's have a prayer together. Shh. Let's have a prayer together. Okay. Obey it. Dear God, thank Bye -bye. you for taking care of us. Thank you for taking care of us. And thank you for 
um, loving us. You for loving us. And thank you for giving us your son. For giving us that son. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John Ward. Beautiful. It's supposed to be 19. Yeah. And that was cute. That was nice. God's word to us today. Would you please join me in our prayer for illumination that's printed in your bulletin? Let us pray. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. Our New Testament lesson today is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19, actually. You can find it on page 893 of your pew Bible. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. 
Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on the straight street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how, how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the, on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Our next hymn is actually number 649, Amazing Grace. This lesson is from 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Paul writes to a younger protege. We've heard from these letters recently, and he's writing about being saved by grace. And I'd like for you to think about the story Kurt read about Paul, Saul's Damascus Road experience as you hear what 
Paul writes in these initial verses because I think you'll make the connection. So listen for God's word. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. About 10 days ago, Cheryl, our church secretary, stuck her head in the door of my study and said, remember, I'm going to be on vacation next week. So I need bulletin information from you for September 11th and September 18th. So what you see in today's bulletin is what I gave Cheryl without having spent any time at all working on my sermon based on 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 17. If I had given Cheryl information this week for today's bulletin, some things would have been different. Kurt already announced the change in our second hymn. Originally, it was going to be Alas and Did My Savior Bleed, which is an old Lenten hymn. But in light of the story of Saul's experience on the Damascus Road, I want you to think again about that first line of that much beloved hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The sermon title in today's bulletin, Gratitude for Mercy, is not at all original. It's the subject heading above these verses from 1 Timothy in my study Bible. Cheryl said, I've got to have a sermon title. There you go. (laughs) It's not a bad title for this sermon, but after working through the text this week, I probably would have chosen a title such as Salvation for Service or saved to serve, something like that. It's hard to go wrong affirming our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed, but considering what Paul wrote to Timothy about his own experience of God's call and God's grace, I think I would have used a section from a brief statement of faith from our Presbyterian Church USA. It's sort of toward the end of that statement of faith, and it says this, We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the church. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. Speaking of God's grace, somebody this week reminded me of a joke that I told one time. I'll tell it again. It's it's so bad it's good. A man died and went to heaven. St. Peter met him at the pearly gates and said, here's how it works if you want to come in. You need a hundred points to make it into heaven. You tell me all the good things you did while you were on earth, and I give you a certain number of points for each deed, depending on how good it was, and when you reach a hundred points, you get in. Well, the man was a little taken aback by that because, you know, he was a good Presbyterian, and this was something different. And he said, well... I was married to the same woman for 50 years, and I never cheated on her, even in my heart. 
St. Peter said, that's wonderful. Three points. Three points, said the man. That's right, three points. What else you got? man said, well, I attended church all my life, and I supported its ministry with my tithe and my service. That is terrific, said St. Peter. That's certainly worth a point. <laughs> One point, said the man. Well, how about this? I started a soup kitchen for homeless veterans, and I volunteered at the crisis center, and I, I was always involved in my church. That is fantastic, said St. Peter. I'll give you two more points. And the man was just beside himself, and he said, two points at this rate. The only way I'll get into heaven is by the grace of God. And St. Peter said, come right on in. <laughs> the joke is right. You can't earn your place in heaven. That's given to you by the grace of God, a pure gift. But the works that the flustered man listed for St. Peter are nothing to laugh at. It's important to get the order right, however. In Ephesians, Paul reminds us, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as the result of works or deeds so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Not in order to be God's children, but because we are God's children, we're created to do those good works. From May 29th to the 31st, 1934, 39 ordained ministers, 53 church members, and six university professors representing the Lutheran Reformed and United Churches in Germany met in a place called Barmen in a town called Wuppertal. And the Theological Declaration of Barmen was written by this group of church leaders. It's one of the confessions of faith in our book of confessions. They wrote this confession of faith at great risk to them to try to help Christians in Germany withstand the challenges of the Nazi party and of the so-called German Christians, which was a popular movement that saw, saw no conflict between Christianity on the one hand and Hitler's claims of National Socialism on the other hand. But these people at this synod meeting saw quite a conflict between the two. They wrote a very short declaration and in the declaration they first cite scripture texts and then they in their words reject what they call false doctrines and in giving the reason why they wrote it they said as members of the lutheran reformed and united churches we may and must speak with one voice in this matter today precisely because we want to be and remain faithful to our various confessions we may not keep silent since we believe that we have been given a common message to utter in a time of common need and temptation. In view of the errors of the German Christians of the present Reich Church government, which are devastating the church and are also thereby breaking up the unity of the German Evangelical Church, we confess the following evangelical truths. The second affirmation cites 1 Corinthians 1.30 which says, Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Then the confession boldly proclaims this, as Jesus Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins, so in the same way and with the same seriousness is he also God's mighty claim upon our whole life. Through Jesus Christ befalls us a joyful deliverance from the godless fetters of this world for a free, grateful service to his creatures. We reject the false doctrine as though there were areas in our life in which we would not belong to Jesus Christ, but to other lords, areas in which we would not need justification and sanctification through him. 
You see one of the margin notes in the bulletin today is from Flannery O'Connor. I've always, I've liked her reading, her writings, but I've always liked this particular comment about the Apostle Paul. She said, I reckon the Lord knew that the only way to make a Christian out of that one was to knock him off his horse. Well, the Damascus Road story doesn't say a word about Paul riding, or Saul riding a horse, but I guess maybe he decided he didn't want to walk the 150 or so miles between Damascus and Jerusalem, whatever. That's her interpretation. Now, whether he was on horseback or on foot when he met the Lord in person, he ended up on the ground when a light from heaven flashed around him and a voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And this story about Saul's Damascus Road experience is often called the conversion of Saul. Certainly Saul was a changed man, no question about that. He wasn't really converted, not in the sense that we usually talk about, you know, changing from having no faith in God to having faith in God or from worshiping that God to worshiping some other God. Instead, Saul's up-close and personal encounter with Jesus Christ redirected Saul's zeal for God and his devotion to serve God, and Saul was called to a new way of life and to a new ministry. And he seems to reflect on that Damascus Road experience and his call to a new life and ministry when he writes to Timothy about how grateful he is to Jesus Christ for his mercy in his life, which has strengthened him and which judged him to be faithful or worthy and appointed him to the Lord's service. Even though, Paul says, I was a blasphemer, I was a persecutor, and I was a man of violence. And then he says, thanks be to God for the overflowing and abundant grace and mercy and love of Jesus Christ that are mine now. Now, maybe you've had your own Damascus Road experience. Or perhaps you know someone whose life has been turned around by God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. On the other hand, Maybe you've never had a Damascus Road experience. Maybe your faith has been nurtured throughout your life quietly and consistently by your parents or by other adults or by your spouse or by being in church and your faith has grown over the years. Nowhere in the New Testament that I can find does Paul ever say anything remotely like, unless you have a Damascus Road experience like the one I had, your faith is invalid? In fact, in his other letter to Timothy, Paul writes that he wants to see Timothy and he's so filled with joy and that I am reminded, he says, of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. What the Apostle Paul does encourage us believers to do is to lead a life worthy of our calling to which we have been called in Christ Jesus. In our Presbyterian Reformed theology, we talk about a connection between truth on the one hand and goodness on the other hand. It's one of the historic principles of what we believe as Presbyterians. And what it means is, it's not enough to say, I believe this truth. But there's a direct connection between what we say we believe and what fruit we bear, the goodness that comes from what we say we believe. Jesus said, by your fruits, people will know you. And we believe that there is that inseparable connection when we have recognized the truth of Jesus Christ that can turn our lives around and bear fruit and goodness in all that we do. Last Saturday, Pat Barrow and Jim Sills and I spent the day at the Presbytery office in Elizabethtown with the other members of our Presbytery's Committee on the Preparation for Ministry. That committee is charged with the oversight of men and women who are in the process of discerning their call to the ordained ministry of word and sacrament and who are preparing in seminary 
before that call, we met with five people last Saturday. Three of those people were new applicants to be enrolled as inquirers. The inquiry phase is a time to ask questions and to explore more the sense of call that's tugging in their lives. A fourth person who is already an inquirer and is a student at Union Seminary in Richmond brought us up to date on his seminary education and his ministerial work in Richmond. The fifth person, who is also a student at Union Seminary in Richmond, was an applicant for candidate status. The entire presbytery will vote on October 8th on our committee's recommendation that this person be enrolled as a candidate for ordination. This is the final major step in the process that leads to ordination as a teaching elder in the Presbyterian Church USA. Now, two of these people went to seminary right out of college. One person used to be the vice president of his family's automobile business for a number of years. Another woman served in the U.S. Army. The final person is currently working as the director of youth ministries at a Presbyterian church in Wilmington. All of these people shared their call stories with us. They told us how the grace of our Lord overflowed with the faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. And in their particular cases, part of their response of gratitude for God's mercy in Jesus Christ is to discern what they feel to be God's call in their lives to the ordained ministry of word and sacrament. The next day, last Sunday, at our congregational meeting following worship, you elected Kurt Simpson, Dean Hansen, Linda Burroughs, Jason Rouse, and Geneva Moretti to be elders in the Sessions class of 2019. In the next couple of months, these elders elect and I will be learning more about the duties of the office of elder, talking about our own personal faith and about how we function as a Presbyterian church. One of my favorite parts of officer training, year in and year out, is hearing people tell their stories of faith and how they try to live out their faith in God in gratitude for God's grace and mercy in their lives. In those people's particular cases, their response of gratitude for God's mercy is in part heeding God's call to serve Christ in this congregation and heeding God's call to serve his church by being ruling elders in the church. But we are all saved for service. That doesn't mean we're all called to be ordained ministers. It doesn't mean we're all called to be ruling elders in a Presbyterian congregation. But we are all called and saved for service, whether it is in the church or in the wider world. Our forefathers in the Reformation, both John Calvin and Martin Luther, valued the work of all Christians. There was a sense at the time among many people that those who were called by God were only those who were the ordained clergy, which sort of inevitably leads to the thinking that others are therefore sort of second-class Christians or their faith isn't as important. And Calvin and Luther rejected that. And Calvin and Luther valued all people's work as being the opportunity for service to God in Jesus Christ. One person has reflected on their writings and they said that they regarded everyone's calling or vocation as a calling into the everyday world. The pattern then was if you were called by God, you retreated from the world you, into like a monastic order or you separated yourself from the world. But Luther and Calvin said that activity within the world informed by Christ, sanctioned by our Christian faith, was the main means by which the believer could demonstrate his or her commitment to God and thankfulness to God. Have you ever thought about that? What you do, what you do for a living, how you serve other people is one of the main ways you can say thank you to God. To do anything for God, to do it well, 
was a hallmark of authentic Christian faith in the thought of Luther and Calvin. And they said that being diligent in your work and being dedicated in your everyday life, day in and day out, as you go about your work and as you serve your fellow citizens and the people of God, that that is truly a proper response to God's grace and mercy. So how can we say thank you to God for God's great mercy and grace to us in Jesus Christ? Well, we can obviously praise God with Paul when he says, to the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. But we can also say thank you to God by living a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. God's amazing grace has saved wretches like us. But God's grace has not just delivered us. It's not just about us. But God has delivered us for the sake of others. And in our gratitude for God's mercy, we can remember that we are all saved to serve. Let us pray. Lord God of heaven and earth, with gladness we praise you for making us in your image to love one another and to care for your creation. We praise you for the gift of your Son who redeems us according to your grace and guides us according to your will. We praise you for your Holy Spirit who empowers us to show your love to others. We offer all praise and honor to you, our one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. with a very heavy heart that I tell you, and this will be news to some, I think, that Philip Longus died yesterday. And I'm going to go see Georgia and his family this afternoon, so no arrangements have been made yet. But please keep Georgia and all of Philip's family in your prayers. We want to continue to pray for the family of Graham Phillips, who died on Tuesday. And his service was yesterday down the street at First Baptist Church. We want to continue to pray for the family of John Rao, who died on September 8th. And his service was held here last Sunday. We want to pray for Roy and Betty Latiri. Some of you don't know them. They live down in Magnolia Greens, south of Wilmington. Uh, Betty grew up in this community and in this church. And their grandson, Patrick Latiri, died on September 13th, and his service was held yesterday in Willard. We want to continue to pray for Jack and Jan Zesh, uh, for Jack's comfort, and for Jan as she cares for him. Zach Castine shared with me a concern about a good friend of his, Jordan Barefoot, who's been diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, asking to pray for him. Let's continue to pray for George Francis. Um, he sent me some texts this week saying he's recovering. He had a heart attack and had a stent put in, but he, I think, is doing pretty well and wants to regain his strength. And a joy to share with you. Uh, Thursday, I was sitting at my desk, and I, my phone beeped, and it was a text from an unknown number, and I opened it, and it made my afternoon. It was from Eric Edgerton, uh, Lois Edgerton's son, telling me that his wife Amy had just gotten out of surgery for cancer and that it had gone much better than expected. And he specifically asked me to thank the congregation for your prayers. Uh, they have felt them. She's got a prayer shawl that she wraps in, and uh, she's still going to have to have treatments. Um, but Eric was very pleased, so I share that good news with you. Let us pray together. To you, most holy God, the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God.
To you be honor and glory forever and ever. Almighty God, in Jesus Christ, you taught us to pray and to make our requests known to you with prayers and supplications in thanksgiving. Lord, guide us by your Holy Spirit that we may pray not just for ourselves, but always for others. Gracious God, because we are not strong enough to pray as we should, you have given us Jesus Christ and your Holy Spirit, who pray for us in all of your power. With this confidence, we offer our prayers today. God of mercy, hear our prayer. O oh, merciful God, look with compassion on those who are sick. Cheer them by your word and comfort them with your Holy Spirit. Bring healing as a sign of your grace. As your word tells us, if one member of the body is honored, all rejoice together with it. We rejoice with Eric and Amy and the whole Edgerton family upon the good news that her surgery went better than expected. Lord, lift them up. May Amy's body be stronger and may your spirit bring comfort and hope in the days to come. We thank you that George is on the mend. We pray that you will continue to heal his heart and give him his strength back and help him to be back among us. Lord, we pray for Jan and Jack. We ask for you to give his body rest and comfort. We pray that you would give her spirit rest and comfort and the strength she needs as she cares for him. And Lord, we pray for Jordan Barefoot as he begins this journey through cancer. We pray that he will be made strong. Oh God of all comfort, we thank you that you console us in all of our troubles so that we may in turn console our family, our friends, our neighbors with the very same consolation we have gotten from you. We pray that you will stand with those who are mourning today, that they may be sure that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall be able to separate them from your love in Jesus Christ. As your word tells us, if one member of the body suffers, all suffer together with it. Together we grieve with our neighbors and friends, but we also give thanks for the promise of new life in this life and in the life to come because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Loving God, your son wept when his friend Lazarus died, so we are grieved at the deaths of our friends, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Help us to be aware not only of the shadows of death in our lives, but also of the splendor of eternal life. We pray for Georgia and all of Philip's family. Be with them and strengthen them as they make arrangements this week and as they remember Philip with great love. We pray for Sandra and all of Graham's family, and we thank you for the celebration of his life yesterday. We lift up Joyce and all of John's family as they move forward in the days ahead. We pray for Roy and Betty and all of their family as they mourn the death of their grandson, Patrick. Oh God, you have given us a new and living hope in Jesus Christ, and we thank you that by dying, Christ has destroyed the power of death, and by rising from the grave has opened the way to eternal life. O oh God of glory, as we work for and await your new creation, we trust that you will answer our prayers with grace and you will fulfill your promise that all things work together for good for those who love you. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship as we present our tithes and our offerings.
Generous God, we thank you that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like us. We are grateful that you sent your Son, the Prince of Peace, to redeem us. We praise you that everything belongs to you, yet you graciously provide for our very smallest needs. We are grateful for your blessings, for we have enough to share. Lord, help us to be faithful in our use of the gifts you give us. With these offerings, we return a portion of your generous gifts for the work of your church. And we pray that people in our community and beyond will be able to rejoice in your goodness. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before we affirm our faith, I want to say there have been and are, are always special moments in worship at the Wallace Presbyterian Church, but I'm hard-pressed to find too many that are more special than John Ward praying with me <laughs> or hearing a child's voice saying the Lord's Prayer as we all prayed together. We should be thankful for that. Let us affirm our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our closing hymn is To God Be the Glory, number 634. to join the choir in the choral benediction on page 80 in the hymn book. And the other thing on the calendar in the bulletin today, it said that I was going to be on an overnight retreat tomorrow and Tuesday. I'm not sure that's going to happen, so I just wanted to let you know that. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in all truth and love. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. <laughs>